So up until now, well, actually, let me give you a heads up here. So today we'll introduce you to rotational energy. Then you'll begin a mid-unit assessment over rotation concepts covered thus far. If you weren't ditching because you were a senior um, yesterday, then you already kind of heard me talk about this, but um, I'm going to give a lesson. It's not going to take all period. It'll take yeah, maybe two thirds of the period. And then you're going to start a quest assignment. It's called cumulative rotation quest with rotational kinetic energy, which we'll cover today. Parentheses, major grade. So this is going to be a major grade assignment. The rotation unit is very long. So we're going to stop after today's lesson and do an assessment over what we've gone over so far in our rotation unit. And because we do need a third major grade, might as well make it a major grade. Um, it's due Sunday night, Sunday night. Originally, oh, you guys might actually be in here tomorrow. I'm not really sure. You guys have to come at 9.30, right? Okay, so I'm a, hoping we'll actually come to class, in which case you'll be able to work on this tomorrow in class and Friday in class and a little bit of today in class. So you should have plenty of time. Um, someone asked, I think it was Jacob asked yesterday, uh, you still have the free try. I'm not, this isn't the gotcha. I want to make sure you guys are understanding what you're doing. I'll still help you with the problems. I might not just, you know, take you all the way through to the end. But, uh, but yeah. So it is going to be a major grade. It is going to be due Sunday night because I have to put the grades in on Monday. So if you do end up having questions over any of the problems, you'll have to ask either tomorrow or Friday. And then you're on your own for the weekend. Okay, if you haven't finished it by then. All right. I'm zoom back out. And let's talk about rotational energy. And so I like this little simulation to kind of to kind of show you what this is all about, why it's important. So I have a ball here that's going to start a certain height above the lowest point on the ramp. Um, I've turned friction off completely. And on this, on this ball, you have a little circle cake looking thing, a little slice, pie slice, that indicates the rotation, right? You can watch that rotate. Otherwise, if that wasn't there, then you wouldn't know if the thing's rotating or not. If there's zero friction though, and I, it starts from rest, it starts from zero translational velocity and zero angular velocity. It starts from that. If there's no friction here, what is that ball gonna do as it moves down the ramp? It's gonna slide, it's not gonna what? It's not gonna spin. And so that's exactly what ends up happening. Right? And when it gets to the bottom, it has a velocity of about 11 and a half meters per second. Okay, now I'm going to turn friction on. I'm going to turn friction on very high so that it's not, act, it's not going to slip. So uh, when you take AP Physics C next year or the equivalent in college, you'll learn that, um, that sometimes you can have rolling without slipping, which is when it's not skidding, which is what, is what we focus on in this class. But you can also have rolling with slipping. Um, if you've ever raced car, if, uh, future race car drivers in here, um, obviously on a controlled track, right? Um, do you want your tires to spin out whenever you're starting? If you want to win a race, do you want your tires to spin out? No. no, you want your tires to roll without slipping because when you're rolling with slipping, you're wasting energy. You're wasting that rotational energy of the tire. Um, a lot of that energy goes into doing work on the tire itself in the form of shedding off the outer layers, the outer rubber layers of the tire, generating a lot of smoke, generating a lot of sound. All that requires energy. You don't want that energy going into, into those forms. You want it to be going into the kinetic energy, the translational kinetic energy of the car. Um, if you, anyone in here is a bowler, you know that when you throw a good bowler, and I've, I've tried to do this since I was a kid, and I can never get the spin right. When I can get it to spin, it always goes into the gutter. But a, a, professional, a good bowler gets the ball to spin and it curves down the track, right? But that spin is way faster than it's actually rolling, right, to the side. It spins real, real fast. And so you have rolling, but you also have it slipping, right? So it's peeling out on your, in your car, spinning the tires. It's a very, that's rolling without slipping. You can, you can peel out with your car, you can spin the tires, but the, and the car will still be accelerating forward. So the tires are rolling, but they're also slipping. 
In this class, we focus on rolling without slipping. So that means that as this object starts rolling down, it's going to be rolling. It's not going to be sliding at the same time. If it sounds like that's a nitpicky distinction, take AP Physics C next year. One of the main problems that we deal with when we study rotation is going from a ball that has just a linear kinetic energy, and then after it starts moving, then it starts, the friction slowly starts speeding it up, so it's sliding at first, and then it slowly starts rotating, and then eventually it's rolling without slipping. That's a real famous um, physics problem. Uh, how, how far does the object move based on its initial velocity and rotational inertia? How far will it move before it's rolling without slipping? Um, in this class, we don't, we don't really do that. Um, so, so we're just going to be talking about rolling without slipping. So we're going to assume that this guy's not going to be sliding down. And as I'll talk about in a minute, that carries a very important implication that we already know about. I just want to drive it home. But anyway, now I turn on the friction. So now the object is going to roll without slipping. And notice as it gets to the bottom, the velocity now is 9.33 meters per second. So obviously, something's different, right? Uh, one might say, well, energy must not be then conserved. Right? But this is not true. Because this object right here, as opposed to the initial scenario, has translational kinetic energy based on that velocity, but it also has rotational kinetic energy. Okay? And so whatever gravitational potential energy it started with in both cases, you still must have that same kinetic energy at the end, total kinetic energy at the end. So the difference in this speed and that speed, in these two speeds, and the kinetic energies associated with those differences, those, the, the kinetic energy of this guy at the bottom is the same. It's just got an extra term. It's got a rotational kinetic energy as well. Okay, Does that make sense? Okay. And think about it. Gravity has to do the work. Gravity has to do the work not only to make it accelerate translationally down, but also to rotate. Okay. Um, yes, friction is the force that's causing the rotation, but really it's gravity is the agent doing the work that's getting it to rotate. So if I start from here and it's not, it doesn't slide, or sorry, and it doesn't roll, by the time it gets to here, gravity just did work on it to accelerate it translationally to give it kinetic energy. But if it's rolling, then not only did gravity have to do work to get it moving translationally, but it also had to do work on it to get it to rotate. Okay. And so some of the work, and if it started with the same gravitational potential energy, gravity did the same amount of work by the time it gets to the bottom, but now some of that work had to go into getting it to rotate. Okay. Is that making sense? All right. So you want to understand that conceptually because then the math becomes easier and this is where it gets a little algebra heavy just so you guys know so if you're good with your algebra then this shouldn't be too big of a deal but let's talk about an object that is rolling let's say it's a disc so a disc let's say it is a sorry solid uniform disc let me be very specific And we know the rotational inertia of a disc or cylinder or uniform pulley is one half times its mass times its radius squared. And let's say it is rolling without slipping, without skidding, without sliding, however you want to, however you want to um, describe it. So we have an object that's rolling without skidding. Pretend that's Pretend that's uniform, pretend that's round. We know the object is going to be moving with some translational velocity. We call that VT. But we also know that the object is going to be rolling with some angular velocity. And it's going to have an angular velocity and a translational velocity simultaneously. The object has radius R. Now what you want to think back on if, if it's not ingrained in your brain already, when I had the, the, the disc up here that I wrapped tape around and then I unrolled it through one full rotation and we saw that in one full rotation, that guy moves a certain distance and a point on the edge of the 
on the rim, a point on the rim of the cylinder moves the same distance in the same amount of time, which is what led to the conclusion that if this object is moving translationally this way, then a point on the rim is also moving at that same velocity. And I can call that translational velocity. Okay. And I can relate that velocity and this with the equation linear velocity, put it a different color, linear velocity equals the radius times the angular velocity. And if you forget where that came from, that comes from S equals R theta from geometry. And then you divide both sides by time. S divided by time is linear translational velocity. Um, theta divided by time is angular velocity. And so this just comes from directly from something you learned about in geometry. If this is true, then this is true. Okay. If the object is, say it's a bowling ball that's spinning a lot faster than it's actually rolling, then this translational velocity of a point on the rim will not be the same. Right? It'll be moving faster maybe. As this object moves translationally, if it's spinning real fast, and so it's sliding as well as rolling, well then that point might go through two full rotations as the object just moves through one equivalent rotation. Or the, the center of mass moves at a certain distance, and this guy might move much more than that, or much less if it's sliding. So if you're rolling without slipping, this is the important implication. Okay, This will be true. And we can always use that, and we will use that whenever we handle this kind of stuff. Okay. All right, with those considerations in mind, let's talk about the total kinetic energy of this disk. Well, as I pointed out in the opening simulation there, you know, we had that gravitational potential energy translate into both linear kinetic or translational kinetic and rotational kinetic. So our total kinetic energy is going to be the, the translational kinetic energy, which up until now we just call kinetic energy, one half mv squared. But then we also have a rotational kinetic energy term now. They are both kinetic energies. They're both measured in joules. We should be able to combine those guys into a single, a single, um, a single term, which as you see, you'll see we'll be able to do. But let's plug in. I know kinetic energy, translational kinetic energy, is literally just one half mv squared, right? Where v is the translational velocity of the object as it's rolling. And then we write the same equation for rotation, but we make our, our substitutions, right? So it'll be one half times the rotational inertia of the disk times its angular velocity squared. <clears throat> and at this point, I'm going to take a brief aside. Right? Um, many, if not most, if not all of you will already or will in the future learn calculus. And I just want to point this out because some students have difficulty with talking, with talking about the rotational energy, understanding the rotational inertia, rotational energy associated with a rotating object. Um, I see it every year. Understand that this term right here, this term right here is in fact a term that just tells you the total translational kinetic energies of all of the little tiny objects within this object that make it up, right? So if I were to, if, let's say that this guy's spinning, has some angular velocity, omega. Well, if I, and here's my axis of rotation, here's my, the, the center of the object. If I look at a little piece of mass here, let's call that M1, well, that little piece of mass, if this is rolling, is going to have a velocity v1 pointing this way, right? So, and that's a translational velocity or tangential velocity, really, because it's moving around in a circle. That guy's kinetic energy is one half m1 times v1 squared, right? Well, if I have another little piece of mass like right here, call that m2, and that guy's got a velocity v2 closer to the center, so the R value for that guy is going to be a little smaller, um, then that guy's, that guy's kinetic energy is literally one half m2 times v2 squared. Okay. Um, note that we can consider these to be point masses whose rotational inertia is, is, is mr squared, right? This guy would be m1 times that r squared. This guy would be m2 times that r squared. Um, 
But if I was to, and you will learn this in calculus and in calculus space physics, if I was to take this object and divide it up into literally an infinite number of infinitesimally small masses and add up all of their kinetic energies, I get this equation, this expression here, one half I omega squared. Okay. If I was to take each one of these guys and have their, and I already pointed this out before, but just to drive the point home, if I took the infinite amount of infinitesimally small masses here and added up their rotational inertias, which is mR squared, we demonstrated that at the beginning of this unit, then the overall result for a disk would be this expression here, one half times the total mass times the overall radius of the disk squared. Okay. We don't do that in this class, but just understand that's, that's how you arrive at this expression and that's how we know that this works. Okay. And again, you do that for, you divide, you make these guys infinitesimally small and you do it with an infinite number of them all around and we add them all up. The total translational kinetic energies of all those guys are exactly equal to one half times the object's rotational inertia times its angular velocity squared. Okay. Some students, they have trouble like adding these two guys together. They're like, well, this makes sense. This kind of weird, but it works, trust me. And then, Gavin, yeah, when you take AP Physics C next year, I'll show you. And Ms. Fudge will show you how we can actually do that. How we can show that what I had drawn up here leads directly to that. Okay. So let's actually do some algebra here. Let's do some algebra here and see if we can kind of tie these two together. Well, I'm just going to make some substitutions. For my rotational inertia, the rotational inertia of a disk is one half mass of the disk, overall mass, times its radius squared. So I substitute that in for I. But then I'm also going to take this guy and solve it for omega, because I have this omega here. And I can relate that omega to this tangential velocity of a point on the rim, right? The point that's actually in contact with the ground as it's rolling. So I get omega equals V over R which implies that omega squared is going to be v squared over r squared. And so I see this omega here. So instead of omega squared, I can put v squared over r squared. And then immediately, so the algebra, again, you wanna, you wanna be careful here. I make liberal use of parentheses. I mess up all the time when I'm doing my algebra. The, the way I avoid messing up is by using parentheses quite a bit. But what I notice is that R squared cancel. Immediately R squared cancel. And then hopefully you can see that this V is the same as that V. Those velocities are the same. This velocity, I'm using this expression. So it's really the translational velocity of a point on the rim. This velocity is the translational or linear velocity of the object as it's rolling. Those two velocities are the same if the object is rolling without slipping. We learned that before. And we know if that's true, then we can use this equation, okay? Which is what we did. And so if I simplify this now, I have one half mv squared plus this is going to be one fourth and then it's just mv squared everything else canceled one and these are now like terms right this is like one half x plus one fourth x right so what's that what's, what's that three fourths mv squared so that's going to be the total rotational kinetic energy right up until now up until now, an object moving with trans an object of this mass moving with translational motion would have a kinetic energy one half mr square mv squared. Now, if it's rolling, it's going to have some extra kinetic energy. Not quite as much, right? All right, it's half. The the rotational kinetic energy is one half of the translational kinetic energy for a disc or a cylinder. It's going to be different for different objects. Different objects have different rotational inertias. So we'd have to substitute in different eyes here if it was a different object. Do you have a question? Yeah, did we find the rotational kinetic energy or was it the total kinetic energy? This is to total. Right. That R should be a T. Yeah. 
This right here is rotational kinetic energy, which was this. So that's the rotational kinetic energy. This is just the translational energy that we already know that it has. Thank you. Any questions, comments, concerns? Oh, that's only going to be for a cylinder, though. Because okay. <laughs> if it's a if it's a solid sphere, and we'll do a solid sphere in the example. If it's a solid sphere, then the rotational inertia for a solid sphere is going to be two fifths m r squared. Uh, so that's going to be different. Yeah. Okay. So now we're actually going to do example four. And there are some notes on this in the, the set of notes that I gave you. Um, we're going to do example four there. Can I erase all of this? Are we good? And there are going to be numbers for this, but I'm going to do it all symbolically and just plug the numbers in at the end. So a bowling ball with uniform density, first of all, if you know anything about bowling balls, you know that that's not true, right? Bowling balls do not have uniform density. Their cores are actually offset slightly to make it so the spin actually guides the balls a little better. But we're gonna pretend, we're gonna pretend. So a bowling ball with uniform density has mass five kilograms and a radius of 0 0.12 meters. The ball is rolling horizontally without slipping with a linear speed of 2 meters per second. So its initial velocity I'll call V naught, 2 meters per second. When the ball encounters an incline. Notice it does tell you in the problem. You don't have to remember the rotational inertia. It tells you in the problem. I for a solid sphere is 2 fifths m r squared. Notice it says about the diameter. If that's kind of confusing to you, if a ball is rolling, there's no room up here. Everything okay? Did you get that from Thomas the Train? Tank engine, sorry. If a ball is rolling, it's rolling about an axis through its diameter, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it says a sphere rotating about its diameter. In case that was confusing. Part A, if the ball rolls without slipping up the incline, what maximum vertical height will the ball reach? So we're looking for a maximum vertical height. You can call that final position Y or just height H. Um, remember that the object or the, the agent of the force that's going to slow the object down and bring it to a stop is going to be gravity. Gravity is, a, gravity is a conservative force. So the ball can encounter an incline like this, or it can encounter an incline like this, and it's gonna roll up the same distance either way. Because the, the path that you take from initial position to the final position, in the presence of a conservative force, um, the path you take is, is, is not important, right? The only thing that's important is where you start and where you end. And in this case, it's not even horizontally where you start and where you end because there's no forces in the horizontal direction doing work. And so it could be oh, right? As long as we're ignoring work done by air resistance and other frictional forces and things like that. Okay? All right. So let's, since we show the, the initial simulation to kick us off here, was a curved one, let's say it's curved. And the object is gonna roll and then come to some maximum height, say right here. And hopefully, you realize that this is a conservation of energy kind of problem. The easiest way to handle a problem where an object is changing elevation and velocity simultaneously is using conservation of energy. Because I know that here, I do have an initial velocity, and then I'm gonna have a velocity of zero at the top, 
final velocity of zero, right? And so I'm changing my kinetic energy into potential energy. Right? It's the easiest way to handle this stuff. But not only now do I have linear kinetic energy, I also have the energy associated with rotation. Okay. Now all this being said, my equation for conservation of mechanical energy is initial mechanical energy equals final mechanical energy. That's it. But now that we have rotational kinetic energy, I can potentially have three terms on e either side of the equation. I can have kinetic energy initial. I can also have rotational kinetic energy initial. And I can also have gravitational potential energy initial. And then I can also have a final kinetic energy. I can have a final rotational kinetic energy and I can have a final gravitational potential energy. So these potentially can get pretty gross. But like I told you before, when we only had four terms in these kinds of problems, cross out any that you know are gonna be zero. Right? The, remember that the, the point at from which you measure potential energy is arbitrary. So the most convenient place would be potential energy is zero at the initial height that the ball is. And if you remember uh, Mr. P in flipping physics years ago when you were small children, taught you that it's not potential energy per se that's important, it's the change in potential energy, right? So um, we talked about this last period. Uh, and and it, it, again, it's arbitrary. This motor here, it's like 30, 35 pounds. It's pretty heavy. There's a lot of metal in it. There's magnets and a bunch of wire. Um, it's got zero potential energy relative to the, the, the relative to the countertop here. If I put my foot up here on the countertop, which I'm not flexible enough to do, if I put my foot up here on the countertop, there's no potential for this guy to hurt my foot, right? Because there's no potential, there, there's no change in potential energy possible for this guy relative to my foot. So if I measure potential energy from the countertop, it's zero. But then if I push it off the edge and measure the potential energy from the ground floor, from the ground then the object is going to change potential energy, right? And so that change in potential energy is what converts its potential energy here to kinetic energy as it falls. And that would break bones if that thing fell from that height on your foot, unless you got steel toed. So it, it's not, th th this is just a little review from potential, our, our unit on energy. The choice of po position for, the choice of the zero point for your potential energy is arbitrary, but you want to choose a convenient location right there is one location in the universe where the potential energy is of all objects is the same and we actually use that mathematically quite a bit next year you know what what location in the universe is equidistant from all points in the universe come on it's not a real location but mathematically it works infinity right Guys, guys, stop being silly. So yeah, um, when you take AP Physics C next year, which some of you are, right? I think I saw the list. Some of you should be and aren't. Um, anyway. Yeah, gravitational potential energy. There is one reference point that's the same for all where the gravitational potential energy is zero, and that's at infinity. Anyway, that's beyond what we need to do. So... When you have six terms here, we don't want to use all of them if we don't have to. And so I noticed that if ground level is potential energy zero, then I can cross that guy out. At the top, the object stop at the highest point, it not only stops moving translationally, but it also stops rotating. So both of the kinetic energy final terms go away. Now I only have three terms to worry about. Again, the algebra here can be kind of tricky, so you want to be careful. My initial kinetic energy, one half m v naught squared. My initial rotational kinetic energy, one half i omega naught squared. And that's it. 
So that equals my final gravitational potential energy, which is MGY or MGH. Remember, please remember on the formula sheet, it says delta UG equals MG delta Y. This is what's on your formula sheet. But if initial gravitational potential energy is zero, then your initial height is zero, your initial y is zero. And so final gravitational potential energy is simply mg times final position in the y direction, which corresponds with the height. So for this guy, you can use h or y, whichever one you want. All right. But look at, I only have velocity, radius, mass. Those are the only things I have numerical values for, and g, obviously. I don't have i, I don't have omega naught. So this is where I got to use ex what I did before, what I did in the previous part. I need to be able to tie these two terms together. And so I can do that by making the same substitutions. And any time you do this, you do the, make these same substitutions. You make the same substitutions, one half rotational inertia, two-fifths mr squared, times omega naught squared. The object we're assuming is rolling without slipping. So just like in the last one, omega squared is going to be v squared over r squared. So we just plug that in, v squared over r squared. And we know that omega naught and v naught, if this is, if this is omega naught, then that's going to be v naught. Right? Because a point on the edge will be moving with that same speed, v naught. So I can call this guy v naught. So again, it's a big term. It's kind of gross looking, but if you're careful, you just be careful with your algebra. You use parentheses. So that's going to be mgh. So you and and you really, if you're going to do calculus next year, if you're already in calculus, you already know this. If you're going to do calculus next year, you know. I, re I remember my calculus professor. My first calculus. Class, I didn't even take it in high school. I was not a good student in high school. I was all right. But uh, my my cal one of the first things he told me. I hope you're good with algebra. Because in this class, for our, your typical introductory calculus class problem, you might have one, maybe two steps of calculus, and the rest is algebra. Maybe ten steps of algebra. Right? You guys know that. Right? A lot of algebra, a lot of trigonometry, a lot of sines and cosines. The calculus steps, there's one or two of them in each particular problem until you get to some more difficult stuff. So, make sure you go with your algebra. Take one point. Notice, this is a single term, right? We can all see that? Right? Terms are separated by an equals or pluses or minuses. This is one term. So I have three terms here. And everyone brought mass to the party. So mass doesn't matter. And now I'm not, I'm not going to jump ahead too far. I'm going to simplify here. I have one half v naught squared plus numerator 2 denominator 2, numerator r squared denominator r squared. So now I end up with one fifth v naught squared equals g times h. So the algebra is whittling our thing down, making it a little more manageable. What's one half v naught squared plus one fifth of v naught squared? Seven tenths v naught squared equals g times h. And we did have a discussion about this last period, so let me just let me just. Uh, you can write this as seven v naught squared over ten equals g times h. Hopefully, we all can see that. Um, and when I divide both sides by g, it puts g in the denominator here. Okay. Some students don't like seeing it that way. So you can do it this way. You can say, I'm going to multiply both sides by 1 over g. In which case, it's obvious that the g's cancel there. And it's obvious that the g goes in the denominator here. And so our final height then would be... 7 times v naught squared over 10g. I could also divide both sides by g. Uh, you're doing the same, same thing. Division is like multiplying by 1 over that thing. If I divide this by g, I just put the g over the ninja 1, the invisible 1, and then flip the denominator, multiply it the reciprocal, and I end up with the same thing. Right. Notice the only thing it depended on 
was that initial velocity, right? The radius literally didn't matter. It's out of the equation. The mass of the object literally doesn't matter. Any sphere, any uniform sphere, whether it's, whether it's 10 miles in radius or one millimeter in radius, if it has this initial velocity, it will go up a height given by this equation, which we can then, again, the physics here is done. Now it's just arithmetic. Seven times the initial velocity, two squared, divided by 10 times 9.8. You get 0.286. So 0 0.286. So almost a third of a, almost a third of a meter. Okay. Again, whether it's a bowling ball or whether it's a little BB from a BB gun, it's going to go at the same height. Okay. It, everything else being ignored. Air resistance, appreciable for work done by friction, things like that. Because in reality, it probably wouldn't. But in ideal scenario, ideal scenario, they would go up the same height. Again, how do I know that? Literally, the radii canceled out, the masses canceled out. Okay. Any questions? Comments? Concerns? May I erase? All right. One other thing I want to talk about a problem that we would not have been able to solve before. And notice we, we did we did this before. If we have like an object that's going to slide up, that's going to move up a certain inclined, or, or sorry, a curved incline. Before we knew energy, doing this with Newton's laws would be a nightmare because the downward weight force, right, and the direction of motion are constantly changing. The acceleration would constantly be changing because the net force, the normal force, interaction with the weight force would create a constantly changing acceleration, meaning even with, with knowledge of calculus, that would be a real tricky problem. It would be a really gross problem. But then we say, oh, with energy, it's super easy, right? Because all I care about is where I start and where I end. So a similar problem would arise if you didn't, if you're trying to do this problem with Newton's laws. Let's say we have a rod that's rotated about its end that starts off horizontal, like the meter stick with the coins on it, which I actually have set up here, and I'm going to get a video of it. Um, I forgot to bring my tripod today, but I'll get a video of it to show you that your answers are actually correct if you did it right. And let's say we release this guy, and we want to know the angular velocity. We release it from rest, and we want to know the angular velocity once it is vertical. So it starts with an initial velocity of zero, and then when it gets to the bottom, it has some angular velocity that it's spinning with. The reason we couldn't do this with Newton's laws, I mean, you can, but not quite yet, and I wouldn't want to anyway, it'd be a gross problem. I know that the, the weight force is the force that's creating the torque, getting this thing to rotate, and I know that the lever arm is this guy, has the length one half of the overall length of the rod. I know the angle between them is 90 degrees. So the torque due to mg is mg times lever arm, L over two, times the sine of the angle between them. In this case, it's 90 degrees. Sine of that angle is one. So it's just mg L over two. That's the torque, right? But as it rotates through this position or from this position down to when it's vertical, the angle goes from 90 degrees to 100, 180 degrees. Right? That's a straight angle. Yeah. So it's going to go from 90 degrees to not 90 degrees. Right? Meaning that the torque constantly changes. As the object rotates downward, the torque that's creating its angular acceleration is constantly changing. And so we can't really just use net torque equals rotational inertia times angular acceleration, determine the angular acceleration, and then use that with an initial angular velocity of zero to find the final angular velocity. We can't do that. We can't use kinematics because the angular acceleration would constantly be changing. 
but we can use energy, just like, just like in the previously um, mentioned problem dealing with Newton's laws and an object sliding up a curve ramp. So here, the energy, the energy that it starts with would be gravitational potential energy. The energy that it ends with would be rotational kinetic energy, not any translational kinetic energy. For this object to have translational kinetic energy, its axis of rotation must actually be moving translationally. Some students find that difficult to conceptualize. It's like, well, it's moving, it's moving translationally, points on it are. Yeah, but it's rotating around a fixed axis, which means our, our implementation of the rotational inertia takes care of all that, right? That's why I point out that stuff. So that we know that when this thing is rotating, yes, we have a lot of translational kinetic energies of all the individual little parts in there, but those are all accounted for with the rotational kinetic energy equation, okay? So how do I, the, the tricky thing here, in my opinion, is actually the gravitational potential energy, right? Where do we measure that from? Well, we measure that from the center of mass of the object, right? So when I have MGH here, That h is actually this distance. It's the distance that the center of the object's mass has changed. Again, it doesn't matter if it curves or not. And that h is exactly L over 2 in this case, right? It doesn't move the full length of the rod. It just moves through a length equal to half of the rod's length. So that mgh is going to equal 1 half i omega squared. That's going to be mg times L over 2, right? Because h is L over 2. Rotational inertia of a rod rotated about its, its end is one-third ml squared, which, again, you don't have to remember, right? That's on your, your, if you need to use that for a problem, it will be given to you. And then times that final angular velocity squared. So why I'm pointing this out, what we can do here is calculate the final angular velocity, right? I'm gonna go through this kind of quick because we're running out of time. So I have on the left side, g over two equals one sixth L omega squared. So multiply both sides by six and get six G. Divide both sides by L, I get two L equals omega squared, take the square root of both sides, and we get that equation right there. So what's the final angular velocity? With algebra and rotational energy, we could do it in a few steps. Whereas to do this with Newton's laws would be a nightmare calculus problem, calculus-based physics problem. That I probably couldn't even do now because it's been so long. Right? I wouldn't even try. I would just use energy way easier. And then sometimes these kinds of questions say, What's the linear velocity of the end of the rod at that point? Well, then I just use the angular velocity, which I just determined, and relate it to the linear velocity or tangential velocity down here using, in this case, it would be length r, radius of the circle, which is just length r, length l, times the angular velocity, which I determined there. Right? I can do that for here. I can do that to get this guy, which is obviously going to be smaller because the length is smaller, the radius of the circular arc is smaller. Okay. All right, so that's your introduction to rotational energy. Um, again, on the quest assignment, you got angular kinematics, you got angular variable stuff. Uh, remember radians, if you're using anything like this, V equals R omega, S equals R theta, A equals R alpha, Got to be in radians. Got to be in radians. If it's not in radians, you will get the wrong answer. With like one exception. So we don't even talk about that. All right. Bye everyone at home.